Okay. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with, with my friends, uh, so many of my friends, and it's just an honor and a privilege uh, to be included in anything. Um, my name is Amy Spain Duncan. Uh, my sobriety date is March the 6th of 2010. I have a home group. Um, I have an in-person home group, Lambton. I have a Zoom home group, Hope for Today. Um, I have a sponsor who knows she's my sponsor and I sponsor a ton of women. And in regard to that, um, one of my sponsees scheduled her celebration tonight. So I'm gonna do this and then jump off, grab a token, give her a coin and then come back on. Uh, but, uh, cause I'm so proud of her and she's just, she, um, she's done the hard work and, and watching that in women is incredible. And um, I'm a low bottom drunk. And what I mean by that is the annihilation of all things worthwhile. I walked away from my family, my children. I abandoned myself uh, all for the next drink. And I did that over and over and over again until March 6, 2010. Um, on the step 11, I have had quite an experience with step 11. And I want to share some of that with you. And um, now, one good thing that happened for me, and if you're new in sobriety, I, it helped me a lot. Um, I, uh, I went, I was in a homeless shelter and I lived there a year and every morning, every morning we read 86 through 80, uh, 80, we read 86 uh, through 88 every morning. Uh, we would get in a circle. It was one of the requirements. So step 11, and we did that from day one, right? Because it's never too early to start praying. And we we read that. And, and so I had step 11 memorized. But even with that, right, I knew that I wasn't inspired at all times. I knew I had absurd ideas. And I love that in our book. It says we may pay for this presumption and all sorts of absurd actions and ideas. Note to self, that's where the sponsor comes in you need to run all ideas past that sponsor. I still do that today, I'm 13 years sober and I always say I need my sponsor more now than I did then because then I was absolutely convinced that I was insane. And I knew that nothing I thought could possibly be right. So it was easy to utilize my sponsor. But then you stay sober a few 24 hours, you read the book a few times, you sponsor some women, you start thinking you know stuff, right? The ego returns. So I have to always be careful that I still need my sponsor and I still have a brain that will produce absurd uh, actions and ideas for me. So when I'm looking at, at uh, step 11, I want to talk about how I was driven into step 11. And, and um, Bill Cleveland talks about that being driven into the next step. So when I got sober, I had this gift of desperation. Buddy, I had this book. I, I knew what Paige Boiled Al was on. Like I studied this literature because you told me that the solution to all my problems was in this, this book. And I became a student of the text and I would read and underline and highlight. And I stayed in the literature and that's, and I it was sponsored from literature and that's what we did. And, and that was that recovery piece. And then I have this beautiful fellowship uh, for, and, and, and my home group and all these pieces for unity and all these opportunities for service. And that was my triangle. Um, but I had come off the streets. And so I was still real rough around the edges, so to speak. I still am a little bit, but I, I've, I've cleaned up a lot. But everything out of my mouth was a cuss word. And I had my dukes up. And why are you looking at me? And what do you mean you're talking during meeting? That's against the rules. Don't you know the rules? You know, and I was like AA Nazi police. I was telling, you know, I was on fire, you know, for recovery. And my life depended on it. And that's the way I went at it, buddy. Um, and if you, if I sponsored you, God bless those women. I did, I had this idea that, you know, I, I don't sugarcoat nothing, you know, and, uh, I care more about your life than your feelings. And, and I was that sponsor, man. I would just beat you to death with a big book. Um, but, but that's how I heard. That's what I heard. And that's the message I could receive. And it's where I was at. So it worked perfectly. But what happened was I have all these character defects that I've tried to deal with, but they're still present and they're there. And when they come out of me, I'm filled with shame. I'm filled with remorse. I'm filled with guilt. When I lose my temper and, and, and scream, when I get mad, I'm scary. I'm a scare. I, it's wrath. You know, in our 12 and 20, it talks about the seven deadly sins. Since it's wrath. It's not anger. It's not irritated. It's not, oh, I lost my cool. It's wrath. That is 
big and it's loud and it's scary. And that's what I suffer from. One of many of my character defects, but I suffer from wrath. And when threatened or afraid, because right, anger is a secondary emotion. We know there's some fear, there's some pain, there's something else going on. But when I get triggered, I come out like a grizzly bear and I and and people get hurt. They get their feelings hurt, they get physically hurt. Lots of different things can happen because I I have this wrath that explodes in me. I'm a rager. And I was still doing it sober. And man, I I, I couldn't stand it. And I thought, well, I don't want to hurt people. And I keep hurting people. I keep hurting people. And um, this went on. You know, it would come up every now and then it would come out. I was five years sober and I kicked in my neighbor's door. And I threatened to kill everybody in that house. And I meant it. And they knew I meant it. Because I'm I'm dangerously antisocial, sometimes even sober. And uh, I called my sponsor after. (laughs) And uh, told her what I did. And I was crying. I was so full of shame because I knew sober people didn't act like that. I knew, I knew you guys did weren't, I knew that I wasn't supposed to do that. And I'm terrified of the drink. I'm terrified of relapse. I am horrified that, um, that any little mistake could end up with a drink in my hand. And for me to drink is to die. And I'm convinced of that. And I don't know what to do. And, and I, in tears, and I said, when will I stop doing this? And she said, baby girl, You'll stop doing that when you work all the steps. And I was offended. What do you mean? I sponsor women and I run, I lead big book studies. You know, my big five years of sobriety, I'm on fire. I'm out there doing it. I'm in detox centers. I'm doing all the things we do when we're on fire, you know, for AA. And she said the second half of 11 and buddy, she had me because I was good at prayer, but I, I skipped and meditation. Uh, and my, you know, so I, I, I'm a big now, did it all go away? No. Am I better? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm better. Um, and I, and so I, I love step 11 in that it allows me to show up in my totality. It allows me to show up warts and all and, uh, humbly and imperfect before a creator who loves me unconditionally. And you taught me that. And then I always say one of my greatest gifts I got from Alcoholics Anonymous was not only the ability to love other people, but more importantly, to be loved. I had these walls up and I had deemed myself unworthy um, uh, that I would hurt people. I push people away to, you know, to protect that, that, that person inside and Alcoholics Anonymous slowly over time helped me remove those bricks that form that wall that separated me from you, me from my higher power, me from everything and everyone, anything beautiful, right? So, so, but it's a process and I'm getting there. Um, in my prayer life, I love that in right as, as step 10 ends, we get this paragraph. Much has already been said about receiving strength, inspiration, and direction from him who has all knowledge and power. If we have carefully followed directions up to this point, right, and we have begun to sense the flow of his spirit into us, to some extent, we have become God conscious. We have begun to develop this vital sixth sense, but we must go further, and that means more action. Right. So this is where we get into step 11, this more action. I must go further. And it's crazy that I would not do all the parts of this step because uh, my favorite promise in the book is on page 100. And again, another I underlined all the must when I went through the book. I like to cut corners. I want to know. But what do I? I was a C student who could have got A's. You know, the type I'm sure all of you probably were too, because I just want to do enough to get by. But if the book said must, that seemed important and I would underline it. And there's several of those in there. But my favorite promise is on page 100. And it says both you and the new man must walk day by day on the path of spiritual progress. Hmm. If you persist, and this is the promise part, if you persist, remarkable things will happen. 
my life is nothing short of remarkable and magical and insanely ridiculous. Uh, it, it just blows my mind. I, I just laugh and laugh like, whose life pinch me? Um, but that spiritual progress, right? So that that is going to be in six and seven. It's going to be in an amends. It's going to be in an inventory. But once I get through with all that, right, it's going to be in that work I'm doing with my higher power, with my creator. That's my spiritual progress, right? So that's my prayer. And it's my meditation. And it requires both sides of that. Um, I memorized every prayer in the book. Uh, and, and I say them regularly. And I use them. I use the guidelines that it gives us about not praying for ourselves. You know, um, I have an obsession of self. And it consumes me. And all I think about, I wake up and I think, how does Amy feel? What does Amy want to do today? What is Amy going to wear? Is Amy going to put on makeup today or not? You know, it's just all about me always. Um, so the moment my eyes open, sometimes even when I kind of wake up, but I haven't even opened my eyes and I was taught this by old timers you say, okay, God, I'm up. I'm going to need your help <laughs> before my feet ever hit the floor, man. I'm going to need your help. Cause I have this brain that is self-obsessed, right? I have this thing that just worries about me constantly. And, um, so when I, when I'm looking at step 11 and it's weird because it starts when I retire at night, right? So it, it wants me to review my day where I've been selfish. I love that. It says, be care. We must be careful not to drift into worry, remorse, or morbid reflection. I can get trapped there. This is all part of step 11. This is all information in step 11. And these, it's one of the things I love about our literature is it speaks to so many things that I, that I deal with. I've had those um, times when I get into that worry and remorse, oh, the remorse and the, or the morbid reflection. When I think about my past, when I think about the pains I've caused, when I think about when wrath has come out of me, even the mistakes I've made in sobriety and, and we can get crippled down with that. I had an incident last March and I'm 13 years sober and I'm in an airport in New York, just came back from a spiritual spirit filled weekend. And I am um, in an airport in Midway trying to get back to Louisville and my two youngest kids, man, they're not, they, they unloaded on me. They just came at me guns drawn, guns drawn. Uh, and they beat me up with my, uh, drinking and they beat me up with my recovery man they were just beating me up and kids you know they're adult children I don't they're not kids these are adult children um but it crippled me it folded me over it folded me over I was in the bathroom locked myself in the bathroom at Midway Airport because I was afraid if I left the stall I would drink and I just sat I locked myself in a bathroom and started calling calling sponsor calling support members um I couldn't breathe. It was so bad that like, cause I'm, I, you know, because, you know, Lori tells you, we'll tell you, I probably need Alan. And I was so attacked. These kids held my wellness in their hands and they took it from me and I'm folded over, you know, and, uh, and everything's on the line. My husband even said like, don't, I'll drive to Chicago and get you just stay there, you know? Um, and, it, and I went down in my bed, crippled in my bed and I, all the guilt and shame and remorse and, you know, all the, crazy stuff that goes on in my head. And uh, that was on a Sunday. And that Monday, I was still in bed, crippled, you know, just balled up with it. And I thought, do your meditation, Amy, do your prayer. And God said to me, you're of no use to me like this. What? I can't use you like this. When I am in self-pity, when I am in remorse, when I am in this morbid reflection, I am not useful. And the whole point of this deal is to fit ourselves for maximum service. So, you know, it's kind of like put on your big girl pants, make some phone calls, call your Al-Anon friends, find out why you put your wellness in the hands of two mentally unstable <laughs> adult children and let's get busy helping some women let's get busy putting some action into this let's get busy getting well you know um so we're gonna have those we're gonna have those highs and lows and they come and step 11 gives us space for that it gives us room to say i am broken today i'm tired today it gives us an inventory what could i have done different but it warns us let's not let's not stay here Let, let's not beat ourselves up let's let's prepare for the next day let's get ready uh, to be of maximum service. 
And that's where the relief comes in. And then it takes us through the morning and we're asking for the next right action. And I kind of talked about that, the, the um, absurd ideas as, as we learn this. We usually conclude with a period of meditation, but Bill doesn't say if it's gotta be 10 minutes, two minutes, 30 minutes, two hours. I don't know how Zen you are. Maybe you're a Buddhist master. Maybe you meditate for four days. I don't know. I'm good to put on a two minute guided meditation on YouTube and try to get through it. You know, But I persist, I persist. And I found out a secret, no one's good at meditation. It's the practice of meditation. It's the persistence of meditation. That's the deal. I, I think I have to be good at something. And then if I'm not good at it, I stop doing it. Or I think I'm supposed to achieve a certain, no, it's just about, you know, my first sponsor told me, you know, if you want a relationship with somebody, you spend time with them. You spend time with them in a quiet, peaceful place. And that's what I got to do with my higher power. I got to find is in a place, uh, a place of love and connection that um, where I can just be in my totality and everything's okay. Everything's okay. And that piece and centering myself in that, whether it be two minutes or three minutes or whatever I can get to, I persist in that, right? So the promise on page 100, if you persist in the spiritual progress that we're trying to make, and that's what I do. And then it goes down another paragraph and it says, if circumstance warrants, we ask our wives or friends to join us in a period, in a morning meditation. I love uh, group meditation, I do. I I, there's a, and I have found avenues for that practice near me. You just feel connected. If you have never done that, try it. You know, let's follow the directions. Let's give it this, you know, contempt prior to investigation. So yada, 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 just give it a go. Um, and then we pause when agitated or doubtful. I want you to know that the meditation allows me to pause. I could never hit the pause. I overshot the pause. I go from zero to let's burn it to the ground and like point three. There is no in between. I have no pause. I have no impulse control. Like that's a whole other thing. But I'm telling you, pausing. They're like your pause. I'm like, yeah, I forgot the pause. A pop, no pause, straight through. In fact, I hit the gas. I don't pause. I lean into it. Like I just will let my emotions carry me away. The meditation creates the pause. It creates the ability this place for a breath, this place for a moment, this place to respond instead of react. And it helps me when I, as I move forward with that. Um, I love too that it says at the end, uh, we alcoholics are undisciplined. Meditation takes discipline. It takes a certain amount of discipline to sit there, even though your mind is racing and you're thinking and saying, shh, quiet mind, we're meditating. Stop thinking, we're meditating. Start that over, bringing it back. You know, that takes a certain amount of discipline in it, but it says that we allow, we let God discipline us in the simple way we've outlined in this. And the 11th step allows me to develop patience, a pause, some discipline and a relationship with God. And then what I found in meditation is, when I meditate and I feel connected to you, I'm less likely to hit you. I am less likely to hit you in your face. You know, if I think if, if we're all connected, we're all one and I can get to that Zen place, it reduces the rate. And it tells me what it's going to do right here. Here's the promise. It says we are in much less danger of excitement, fear, worry, anger, worry, self-pity or foolish decision. And the, that's me in a nutshell. I am those things. I am full of fear. I'm excitable, I am angry, I worry, I have self-pity, and I make foolish decisions. This, this, this is me, this is what happens to me. Hey, Ponch, the neighbors came home, the dogs are really excited about that. But this is the solution for that. So if that's what's wrong with me, then step 11 is what's gonna help reduce the chances of that. I'm not gonna be perfect, spiritual progress, we are not saints, but I'm gonna make improvement. And for me, improvement is, I haven't put my hands on another human being in three years. And do the math, I was telling you, yeah, that happened. It, it was not as bad as it seemed. Nobody, well, it was bad, but I'm saying, the events where I am crazy or have this wrath or do this, they are less severe when they occur because I have great, big, big, big emotions, right? So they're less severe, less damage is done and there's more time between them. 
They don't happen every week. They don't happen every month. They don't happen every year. You know, now, now I'm getting some space between those things. And then when they do occur, they, they have less volume to them. They have less intensity. And that tells me I'm better. See, my dad taught me that the only person I can compare myself to is to myself on March 5th, 2010. That's the day before my sobriety day. And I'm telling you, as I sit here tonight, the woman here, she's a lot better than that broken woman that walked through the doors on March 6, 2010. And it's because I work all these stops. This is not a foot race. This is not a foot race. Uh, this is a journey. There, there, this is an experience. I'm experiencing life in all its juicy and glorious wonder, in all its pain, in all its sadness, and all its elation, every part of it. I am no longer on mute, and I am here for it, and I get to enjoy it, and I get to do this amazing thing, and you know, that's what I love about Fellowship of the Spirits. That spirit's there. That's what I love about my home group and, I, and my Hope for Today home group, because there's this spirit of love and laughter and joy, and you know, I do want to say rule 62 is my favorite rule. It's not in the book, but don't take yourselves too seriously. You have to be able to laugh at yourself. And if you are, if you cannot laugh at your own mistakes and your own ridiculousness, you're probably going to have a miserable time here. I am ridiculous. I know it. I embrace it. I lean into it. I, uh, but I am doing better and I'm having fun. You know, I'm enjoying everything we do in Alcoholics Anonymous. And today I don't drink. And that's a miracle. And I never want to lose sight of that. I haven't, I don't drink and I don't put any mind or mood altering substances in my body. And even if my kids are whatever they're healing and they're going through, they have a mom who stands ready. I stand ready in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous with you with me in my truth, the truth I discovered through working these steps and continuing to work this program. Another warning about not doing all of 11. Um, you're not going to sponsor well, <laughs> right? So this is all getting me ready to carry this message and to practice these principles. Uh, but if I'm not doing the steps prior to that, then I'm not fit for maximum service to get there. And so what that looked like, like I told you, is me beating, you know, 12 stomping women. That's what Tim Highland you say, 12 stomped women and new women. Uh, because I don't have compassion, understanding, empathy for me or for you. And I'm going to develop that. And that's going to come through esteemable acts. And it's going to come in this prayer and meditation work, this place where I connect with a power greater than myself and start building that relationship. Once I have done that 10 step inventory and I have sat with my creator and I have asked him to direct my thinking and I've done some periods of meditation. Now I'm ready to stand and go be of service. Now I'm more prepared for maximum service because otherwise, you know, I'm doing my inventory, throwing up a quick prayer and coming to whoop you with the big book. You know, I got to stop in between. I got to realize how insignificant I am in this whole process, right? There is a creator and he is the one with all power. I cannot get anybody drunk. I can't get anybody sober, but I'm going to ask this, this higher power if maybe just today he would find a use for me. And it's going to be in love that I'm going to make that difference. It's not going to be in my wrath or my sarcastic remarks or uh, in my um, cruelty or my judgment of you. Those aren't the things, thank you, that are going to bring me to make me useful. If I'm carrying those character defects with me, um, if I'm not pausing in that morning, to, you know, do my prayers, ask God to direct my thinking, spend a period of time in meditation. When I go out my door, I am in danger of bringing all um, the worry and the fear and the, and my character defects that show up to support all that. And, I, and it's in love that I'm going to be effective. It's in genuine concern for you. It's when I can put myself aside and focus on you for a minute. Like Don Major used to said, whoever's in front of you, make them the most important thing you're doing right there. Give them your full attention. And I can't do that if my mind is racing and scrambling and thinking about me. So that's why the prayer and the meditation. Now I got a better, I'm not great at it, but I'm better. And I got a more, I've got a better shot at being effective in this thing that we do. And, uh, 
And I want to be effective in this thing we do because tonight I get to give out a five-year medallion because I did some meditation. I did some prayer and I made sure that I was representing this program appropriately to that new woman. And she latched hold and now she has a miracle to share. And that's the deal. And that's what we're here doing all the time. Um, I love you guys so much. I can't wait to hear Lori and, um, and, and the rest of the speakers tonight. And so I'm going to end with that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's welcome our second speaker, Lori G, who will be sharing her experience with the 11th step for what's happening. Hey, everybody. My name is Lori Gidding. I'm a grateful member of Al Anon. <clears throat> I don't know if we're recording or not recording, but it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> Jen's over there about to crawl under the desk. It's fine, Jen. Don't worry about it. Don't take ourselves too seriously. Um, uh, Amy did a great job. I always love listening to Amy. I, I really can't add a whole lot to that, to be honest with you. I too was a rager. Um, and I'm going to tell you, I raged in, um, in recovery also, I will just say. And so um, there's a lot of similarities and I, I would never, ever tell you that you need Al-Anon unless I really thought you need, did. So, um, um, okay. Step 11. Um, you know, um, the first word in that is sought. And I will tell you, um, I was always seeking um, for most of my life. And when I was a little girl, I grew up in church. My dad actually helped start a little church when I was, um, when I was little. I don't even, I don't remember ever not being in church when I was a little girl. And um, we were one of those families that you went every time the doors were open, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, business meeting, revival, whatever, we were there. And, um, and you know, as a little girl, I loved that. I really did. Um, I loved going to Sunday school and I loved seeing everybody because it was like social time for a little kid. When you're just six, five, six, seven years old, four or five years old, that's just a lot of fun. And so I had heard about God my whole life. And when I was seven, my parents got a divorce and um, everybody in my family pretty much stopped going to church. Um, my dad never darkened a do church door again. Um, and my my mom would, would go to church periodically, um, but not very often. And I have two sisters and older brother. None of them ever went to church again. And, um, but I did. And um, I was always seeking. And um and I, and I was always looking for that feeling, um, of just being okay again. And, uh, and things were not okay in my life at seven years old. My mom had moved me from the country, um, on 10 acres to a little, um, suburb of the city. And I hated everything about it. And, um, and kids were mean to me and I was getting teased a lot. And it was just, I was just not comfortable and I was not okay. And I was always looking to get okay again. And, um, and so I, I just through the rest of my life growing up, I was, I was always trying to, to figure out, um, you know, how to get that feeling again, how to get that feeling of okayness again. And, um, you know, I didn't go to church for a long time and then I would go for a while and I went to churches with my friends and I did all that kind of stuff because I was always seeking. And it wasn't until I got into Al-Anon that I actually found God. And um, I found God in these rooms and I did not find God in church. And that I, I just want you to know, that's not the church's fault. And don't think that I'm blaming church because I'm not. I could not hear it. I was not ready. Um, and it and it had nothing to do with with that, with the church or in any church, any religion. And just it just wasn't for me. It just didn't work for me. And I got the spiritualness of the program here really quickly. Um when they start talking about. God immediately, I thought, oh, here we go again, you know, and not that I was against God, I wasn't, but I thought, I'm not sure this is going to work, but I stayed open-minded enough to give it a chance. So when it goes, when it starts talking about, we sought, sought, I'd been seeking my whole life and I found God here. So I love that the steps are in these, or the orders that they're in. I think they're so divinely inspired. Because by the time we get to step 11, we already have a, we already know that there's a God and we already have a relationship with him. And it says sought through, and it tells you exactly what to do. We sought, 
And how did we seek? Through prayer and meditation. Sought through prayer and meditation. Now, listen, I'd prayed my whole life. I'd prayed, I'd learned those little, those prayers when I was in Sunday school, you know, that now I lay me down to sleep prayer, which by the way, is a little creepy if you think about it when you get older anyway. <clears throat> and as, but I'd said a lot of prayers. I'd said a lot of prayers my whole life. I knew a lot of prayers. I had, I had said a ton of prayers. I had, re, I had memorized a lot of prayers. That's what you, that's what you do when you grow up in a Southern Baptist church growing up in, a, in the South of, in here in Oklahoma. And so, but I don't think I really prayed. I mean, really prayed until I got here. I'd said a lot of prayers. I mean, I'd done those foxhole prayers, those emergency prayers, you know, break glass for God kind of prayers, you know, when I was really in trouble and I needed help and I couldn't get out of it and I, I had no other choice than I would pray. But to really have a conversation with God or your higher power sought through prayer and meditation, I, I had not really done that till I got here. I mean, really done that. And meditation, you know, I think of prayer and meditation as prayer is talking to God and meditation is listening to me. And, and, and I'm going to tell you, uh, there is, there's no wrong way to meditate as long as you're trying. I mean, that's really the truth. If you're just, if, if you're trying, you're meditating, if you're just trying, and I've done it a million different ways. And it has changed as I've grown, as I've gone through this program. And as I've, as I've grown through this program, <clears throat> my dad died a month before I came into Al-Anon. And my dad had been sick for a long time. He'd been sick for, um, uh, he'd been sick for a while and then he got better. And then the last year of his life, he was pretty sick. And I'd spent a lot of time with my dad and, um, and I was constantly either at his house or at the hospital. Um, almost weekly, I was, I was at, I was with him or daily sometimes, sometimes. And, um, and I was, I, I just spent a lot of time with my dad. And, um, and I think about this and I'm, and I'm not saying, you know, I don't know how all this works out, but I can tell you this, my dad died and a month later is when, um, I found out how, how much my husband was drinking and using. And I'm going to tell you, had I, I don't think, had I found out while my dad was still alive, I don't know how, how that I could have handled all that at the same time. And I don't think I would have had the time to devote to my recovery. But one of the things that I did is I had never exercised a day in my life and um, I'd always wanted to run. I'd always wanted to learn to run. And so I started running in the mornings and, um, and I would, I would talk, talk to God and get on my knees in the morning and I would pray and I talk to God and I would go and I get, get on my shoes and I would go run around our neighborhood and I would just listen and I would listen and try to hear God talking to me. And, um, and I would get some messages. I, I just would, I would, things would pop into my brain that did not come of me out of me. And, um, and I remember I would be crying. I'd just be running down the road crying because, um, things were being revealed to me. And I did that for a long time. That's how I meditated for a long time was running. Uh, and that was it. And I don't run anymore because sanity has returned. Um, but I don't run anymore. So, um, I had to, I had to figure out something else to do. And, and, um, and, and one of those things that I did is I, you know, I read my, I have all of our daily readers. I read all of our daily readers every day. And then I also have some other spiritual books that I, that I read out of, um, that are from all over. I mean, I, I, I have a variety of spiritual books that I read out of from all different backgrounds and all different, um, beliefs and, and everything, because I, I, I try to be as wide open as I can. And I try to get it from wherever I can, because I think that God talks to all of us and we just have to be quiet enough to listen. And, um, and I'm not a quiet person and I'm not a still person. That's not me. I am, uh, my mind goes constantly. It's uh it's a rat race up there. And it, so that was really hard for me. So I would read and what I would started to do is I would read on something and then I would just pause and I would close my eyes and I would think about what does that, how does that reading apply to my life today? And I would just meditate on that reading for a while. And then I would do another reading. And sometimes I could stay focused on a reading and I could really get a lot out of that. And I could, I could, I could hear a lot 
And there are sometimes I would go to the next reading and I would, I'd really try to meditate and think about how does that apply? And I, I wouldn't get very far. And I think, okay, well, that's not where I'm supposed to get the message today. And then I might read something else. And, um, and so that's how it started. And that kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, has evolved. And uh, I still do those readings every morning and I still read other things. Um, and I try to listen to see uh, and, and focus on that, whatever I'm reading to, to find out what does that have to do? How does that apply in my life? What, what, is, what am I, how am I supposed to, what am I supposed to do with this message? How is this reading today um, applicable in my life? And how does that apply in my life? And how, and what do I need to work on? Um, I got to go be uh, last this last Friday. I got to go uh, be with a bunch of great Al-Anon members, longtime members. One that lady, um, who's very, I mean, like we're family. She's sixty-one years in the program, and another lady is uh, forty-two years in the program. And we were, um, we were talking. We had a little meeting, and one of the things that um, that she said is. You know, sometimes I just look around and I say, God, have I ever thanked you for and whatever it was that she was noticing in her life. And, um, you know, I think one of my first prayers um, was thank you, you know, thank you. Thank you that my husband's sober. Thank you that I have this program. Thank, thank you that I'm getting to know you and um, thank you for my life today. And, um, but I think after you've been here a while, at least for me, sometimes I don't, I take some of that stuff for granted. And, um, you know, I started, I've started in the last few days doing God have I ever thanked you for and, um, and whatever is, is current and noticeable in my life at that time. So sought through prayer and meditation. <clears throat> um, and, uh, the praying for a uh, knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. And, in um, and in how, how Al-Anon works, um, I got this out because I was trying, I have highlighted some stuff in it from when I first got here. And one of the things that I highlighted was most of us have learned the hard way that the only will worth pursuing, the only guidance worth praying for is knowledge of the will of God. And I will tell you, I was not looking for God's will when I got here. I was looking for my will. As a matter of fact, I was trying to get God to do my will. And because if he would do my will, I thought I would be happy. And I was not praying for God's will. I didn't even care about God's will. All I cared about is what I, what I wanted and how I wanted it and when I could get it and how I could get it. And there was not, there was no, um, asking for God's will. And, um, and, and, and it's not just asking, it's praying only. That's the only thing we're praying for only for his knowledge of his will and the power to carry that out. Because I may know, I may figure out what God's will is, but do I? Have, but I don't have the power on my own to carry that out. And um, and I'm going to tell you, there are there are days that I will tell you that I have gotten messages where I believe that. And when I say messages, I'm not saying that I have a booming voice of God talking to me. I'm just saying I kind of get an intuition or a feeling or or, or a knowledge of of what I think. It, uh, that God wants for me for that day and what his purpose is for my life for that day. And, and, uh, there are times that I will think, I know that this is what I'm supposed to do, but I don't know that I can do this. I don't even know how I'm going to do this. And I think that that's why we pray for the uh, power to carry that out. Cause I can't, I don't have the power a lot of times to carry out God's will on my own. I just don't. Most of the times I don't. And, um, and I have to pray for the power to carry that out. And he gives me that power. He does, he will, he, if, he, if it's, if it's what his will is, I promise you it will come really easy for me. I have learned that when it is my will and my way, I hit a lot of roadblocks. I will fight through a lot of stuff trying to get my will. And when it's God's will, it's a pretty smooth course. It is pretty easy. I, uh, I don't have to fight it. Doors just kind of open for me. And, and that's the way that it has been since I got here. And since I started, uh, practicing these principles and taking these steps and applying it to my life, not just reading it, not just going through the motions, but actually taking those steps and applying them in my lives, my life as spiritual principles. And, um, <clears throat> 
you know, I think, you know, 10 and 11 and 12, you know, if I was just going to go through the motions, I'm just going to stay stagnant. And, you know, we caught talk about these being growth steps and, and uh, in step 11, it is where I grow my relationship with my higher power. It, it's just kind of like what Amy was talking about, you know, when you meet somebody and you want to get to know them, you have conversations with them. You ask them questions. You find out about them. You you talk to them. They ask you questions. You talk and you develop this relationship. And that's how it is with me and, and my higher power today. You know, I I talk, I, I pray to him. I pray with him. I listen to see what he has for me for that day. Um, and sometimes I, you know, a lot of times, I don't ask for anything from God. I usually just say, you know what, God, whatever your will is for me today, let me do that. Show me what to do. Give me the way to do that. But every once in a while, I will tell you if I'm in a place where I feel I'm disconnected or I feel like I'm not um, where I need to be, sometimes I'll have to, I ask God for help. And what I say is, you know, God, I don't know why I'm so disconnected. I'm not sure why I'm in this place right now. I'm not sure what's going on, but if there's something I can do and somebody I can help, help, please put them in my path today and show me what I would, what you'd have me to do. And, um, and sometimes I need to work with somebody else to get out of me and to get out of my head, to get out of my spot, to get out of whatever. And, um, I will tell you more times than not, he will put somebody in front of me. Um, I will tell you back um, in 2000 and I think it was 12, um, I had had a rough year. I just had a rough year. My stepmom had died. There had been a lot of tragedy in our family. We had a lot of stuff going on. And it seemed like every month I was getting hit with something. I mean, it was my son had a wreck and wouldn't talk to me. My oh, We had a murder, suicide in our family. We had... Um, to move our uh, offices six floors and we had two weeks to do it. And um, my best friend's young, young teenage daughter um, was pregnant and they were, you know, that my, my best friend is somebody who has intuitively known how to do the right thing her whole entire life comes from good people, has never done anything wrong and just, and has, and has, has a great upbringing. And she would, she just did not know what to do with that situation. And it just seemed like every month there was something. And, you know, um, I got to be there for my best friend and tell her, you know, it's going to be okay. God's going to take care of it. It's he's it, going to take care of you. It's going to take care of that, of your daughter and everything's going to be all right. And, um, you just, you got to get okay with it because that baby's coming and there's not anything you can do about it. And, um, and, you know, and I got to, and I got to be there for her. And I'm going to tell you in the past, I would not have done that. I would have ran and I would have been selfish and I would have been scared and I would have not been a friend. And so that year it was really horrible and everything was happening. And at the end of that year, around October, um, I remember calling my sponsor and saying, you know, I'm doing all the things I'm, I'm praying and I'm meditating and I'm reading my stuff and I'm talking to my sponsees and I'm calling you and I'm going to my meetings and I'm working, I'm doing everything that I'm told to do in this program. And I just feel like I am disconnected. And she said, you know, you've been fighting fires all year long and, uh, and the fires are out now and this, it's, it's smoldering now and there's smoke in the air but you're exhausted and you're tired and now you just need to rest and you need to ask God for what you need. And, um, I remember I got on my knees and I had told God, I said, I need to know how to get, uh, reconnected because I even felt disconnected a little bit from him, even though I was praying and meditating and doing all the things I still had a little disconnect and I couldn't figure it out. And I remember getting on my knees and I said, you know, I. I need to figure, I need to know what to do here. I need some help. And, um, and I said, if, if, it, if I, if a newcomer is what I need, will you put, put one in my path and show me what to do? And uh, the very next day, I kid you not, the very next day, a girl called me and she said, I'm looking for a sponsor. And I've had three people who have recommended you. Would you mind sponsoring me? Could we talk about that? And I've, I still sponsored her this day. And, um, and then um, uh, I had a, 
I had a feeling that um, we needed, we didn't have a women's meeting, a women's Al-Anon meeting. I know that everybody thinks that all Al-Anon women, all Al-Anon meetings are women's meetings, but they're not, but we didn't have one that was specifically for women. And um, I had talked to some people, I talked to my sponsor, uh, I'd prayed about it and and um, we thought that we might want to start a women's meeting and we did that um, and we started a women's meeting and I'm going to tell you that gave me a, um, uh, that gave me a lot of uh, connectedness and uh, we started this women's meeting and the reason why that women's meeting was so important is because there was women that could not share about certain things in, in a, in a meeting, in an Al-Anon meeting where there were men available, there were men present and most of our meetings honestly here um, most of them are, have men in it. And so um, we started that meeting and we've that meeting still going to this day too. And so I think that if you, if you really do take this 11th step and you apply it in your life and you really do ask for God's will and the power to carry that out, that he, he will show up. And sometimes he shows out, but he will show up and he will give you exactly what you need. And he will give you the ability to do that. You know, there's things that we hear all the time about, you know, um, uh, God give, doesn't give us more than we can handle. And I, and I, you know, I used to believe that, but I don't believe that anymore. I believe that God does give us more than we can handle. And I think that's because we need to rely on him. I think that's because he wants us to know that he's available to us and that we, that we can do anything with him, that he, that we need his help. That's why 11th step is so important because we pray for his will, not for our will. Because I've been doing my will my whole life and it got me in a lot of mess. And uh, and it got me and it got me uh, in these rooms, which I'm grateful for. But I'm going to tell you, that's the best I could do um, is desperate enough that I finally came here. And uh, and, you know, I, I, I think that um, there's another saying that, you know, um, uh, I, you know, God. Uh, what is it that I was, what is it this other saying that we have? Um, I don't remember, but I can't remember the deal, but, it, but it's, but it's basically, you know, that, you know, God makes the best out of everything and, and, or, or that, that everything is God's will, I, you know, well, that's God's will, you know, well, I don't know what God's will is. I have to, I have to talk to him and ask him, but I do think that, that God makes the best out of every bad, bad situation, that there's some good that will come out of every everything. And if we ask, ask him and talk to him, and I say him, her, she, whatever you believe, again, I don't care. Um, let me just say this, this is kind of my thing on God. It talks about as we understand God and, and you know, I, I had this theory and this is just my opinion and you can believe whatever you want. I'm not telling you to believe anything, but this is what I can't, this is what, how I finally got comfortable with it is that I think there's only one God. I think there's only one God. And I think just like there's only one of us and, you know, I'm, I'm one me and I have a son and he calls me mom and I have a granddaughter and she calls me Lolly and I have a husband and he calls me honey. And, uh, and I have friends that call me Lori and I have, um, some friends from high school that have some nicknames for me that we're not going to go into, but everybody calls me something different. And each and every person that I have a relationship with, every one of those relationships is different. My relationship with my husband is different than my relationship with my son. And my relationship with my son is different than the relationship with my granddaughter. And my relationship with my friends from high school are even different from the friends that I have today. But there's just one me. And they all call me different names. And they all know me in a different way. But there's just one me. And I think that's how God is. I think there's one God. And I think we all get to him and we all have a certain relationship with him and it's all individual. And some people call him Jesus and some people call him God and some people call him Buddha and some people call him the sun, moon and the stars. And some people just call him the energy and some people don't even have a name for it. They just know that there's something bigger than us out there. And I think that we all, and we all each have our own different relationship with that power, whatever that is and whatever you choose to call it. And and that's why, as we understood him, is so important because we got to understand that the best that we can. And you know, there's a there's a one of our readings says I've come to uh, understand a God which I can't fully understand, and I think that that's true. I don't think I'll ever completely understand who my higher power is or what he is or completely understand him. But I continue to grow that relationship through step eleven, and so I just want to continue to know that power more and better 
and rely on that power more and better. And I will tell you, I, I before I got here, I didn't trust anything. I believed that there was a God, but I didn't trust him. And today I really do trust that that power has everything under control and that I can rely on that power no matter what. I really do trust him with everything. And people ask, you know, will come to me at times. And I will tell you, if I have a motto, it is God is in charge. If I, if there was a, if anybody says, what's your motto in life? My motto would be God is in charge because he is. And I know that he is. And I trust that power. And I know that I don't have to be in charge today. And you all should all be grateful for that, by the way. My family is extremely grateful that I don't have to be in charge today. And I am absolutely relieved that I don't have to be in charge today. But there's something bigger than me that is. And um, I just got to get out of the way and let him work. And when I can do that, my life turns out pretty well. Thanks for having me.